how do you live in victory in the new year? And, and I don't know about you, but there's just so much going on that challenges that. So you think about Joyce, and we've talked to her on the phone, and, and you don't probably know her quite as well, but a really precious lady. Uh, Ruthie and I have come to know her quite much better through all of this, and, and we really love her. But what do you say to somebody who loses their husband at Christmas? And when we were with our kids in San Diego, we went to their church for a Christmas Eve service and found out that the pastor wasn't going to be there because he was at the hospital with one of the church families whose 20-something son had been in a car accident and died on Christmas Day. And, and what do you say? And then there are so many of you that are going through one thing and another. Marie Browning is just this precious lady who calls so many of us on the phone to tell us how to pray for others. So I think probably we ought to pray for her, don't you? So Marie, we will. That's tomorrow morning early is your surgery. Actually not. It's still at 5.30 in the afternoon. In the afternoon. Yeah. I got 5.30. I thought it was in the morning yeah. since I had my I surgery. Wish. Then. Yes, I understand. All right. And then how long will you be in, Marie? Do you know? The doctor said about two days. Two days. All right. And then we'll pray for Chuck. We all know that when you go through this as a couple, it, uh, it's challenging. So we want to really be praying for them. And then there are so many other things. Uh, David Payne, we need to keep, keep praying for him, as you know, kind of a walking miracle. And then we can just go on and on and on. So with all of that in mind, as we enter this new year, with all of its uncertainty, both personally and internationally, how do we live in victory? Well, how would you really properly prepare for 2015, start in a few days? For the world, it means making resolutions, setting goals, and having a New Year's Eve party. Uh, yesterday, our kids came up with us about halfway, and we love the decorations at South Coast Plaza. You ever been there? It's just worth going to see those. And uh, as we were walking through Macy's on the way back to the car, we walked through rack after rack after rack of these, what they call, I think, cocktail dresses that the ladies would wear at their New Year's Eve parties. And so many people, that's how you welcome the new year in. And then I never have quite gotten what's the thrill of watching a ball come down a post in New York City. <laughs> this doesn't do a thing for me. So how do you really prepare? Well, for the Christian, starting a new year involves two major focuses. And I want to think about these with you today. The first one is to have a growing confidence in the Lord. And so when we look at Joyce, or we look at this family that's lost their 20-something old son, how do you have confidence in the Lord? <clears throat> Who wants to lose their husband? Who wants their child to die? Who wants a diagnosis of whatever it is that may be coming? How, how do we deal with that? And then the second one is to make it my goal to please the Lord. And I want to help you see how those two go together. Now, I'm really hoping that both with this message and the one next week, I will have given you something more than information. What we're going to talk about, for many of you, you know, but I hope it strikes you. And I wrote this message while I was recovering from the surgery. They, and I spent most of that time stuttering, studying, suffering, not because I was suffering as such, but Carol and I are very involved in trying to raise the consciousness of the church in pastoral care and oversight. And so I'm wanting to really be more prepared to deal with suffering and helping people deal with it than ever. So that's what I've been looking at. And as a result of that, one of the things I did while I was out completely for two weeks, and then kind of coming back since then, is to look at suffering. And the place I went is to James. And uh, I, I want us to think about, now those two goals I gave to you, having a growing confidence in the Lord and making it my goal to please the Lord, what's going to hinder us from those two things? Well, the first thing is allowing people or life or Satan or even my natural thinking to rob me of my confidence in the Lord. And I have to tell you that there is a real sense in when you start facing things like deaths, or medical problems, 
one of Satan or your friends or yourself, your own natural inclinations, will say, you know, does God really care about me? Now, I've thought a lot about this family in San Diego that lost their son. And the piece you don't know yet is that the son did not know the Lord. So that means if the Bible is true, that their son went to hell. So that just deepens the whole thing. With Bud, we know that Bud went to be with the Lord. It is a victory for him. So how do we have our confidence in the Lord in place? There is so much that would rob us of that, and we want to look at that in some detail. A second thing that would cause us uh, to lose this focus is to choose to have as my goal in the new year, my agenda, my goal, my happiness, my plan, my definition of what a great year would look like. And I want to try to help you understand that piece as well. Because if you don't comprehend that, your confidence in the Lord will come into question. The two of them go so close together. Now it would be fun, and we might talk about this a little bit when we're together on Wednesday in the more informal setting, is what would the perfect year look like for you in 2015? If you could write down, just in a phrase or two, my perfect year would be this. It's always fun for me. I don't know if you pay much attention to our little Connections magazine around the church. And each month they interview a different church leader. And one of the questions they ask is, what would be a perfect day for you? You ever notice that? Yeah. And it's always kind of amusing, amusing for me to see what people say would be a perfect day. Well, what would a perfect year be like for you? And I want to suggest to you the perfect year involves the two things we're looking at. That I would have a growing confidence in the Lord. And I would have no other goal higher than, God, I want to please you. Now, I think if you could say that, and we'll base that on James 1 here in just a minute. If you could say that, whatever comes this year, you will have the best year you've ever had. Because you see, if I have absolute confidence in the Lord... Even if my child dies, even in an unsafe state, and I can say, Lord, it is my goal to please you, I can have victory. Now, I want to warn you as we go here that what I'm going to share with you in a minute makes no sense. This is just crazy. So let's look at it. James 1, 2 to 12. We'll look two weeks at it. We're going to tear it apart and look at it. But I want you to see, this is just crazy. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. You see why I say this is crazy? You see, what? Consider it pure joy when you encounter various trials. That's just crazy. And yet it is God who has written it to us. And my prayer is that as we look at this, and we'll review things like this throughout the whole year, but at least these two Sundays, that you'll get a grasp on how we do that. Now, do you realize that if that is true, you can have the greatest year no matter what comes? And this is the gift I'd like to really give you is an understanding of that phrase. Now he goes on and he gives us lots to help us do it, but, but that's the catch. Consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when you encounter various kinds of trials. So how is it? Has that been the pattern of your life? I gotta tell you just one of the most difficult things for me, this sounds really petty, over these last few weeks, doctor says uh, no bending, no uh, lifting, and no, what's the other one? Turning. Turning, twisting. Yeah, it has a BLT or something. Is that right? BLT. <laughs> bending, lifting, twisting. <laughs> now, I am absolutely convinced that when the doctor did the surgery with me, he inserted a new gene called the dropping gene. <laughs> I have been dropping stuff like I never have before. And no bending, twisting, lifting. There it is on the floor. 
And I've gotten so disgusted with myself, and Ruthie keeps saying, don't pick it up. Well, I've got to a way now where I can bend my knees a little bit, I can do some, but you know, isn't it interesting how the slightest little thing can just rob us of pure joy? I mean, I'm being really quite silly about it, but can I count it pure joy when I drop something and I can't pick it up? <laughs> well, see, for most of us, that's not how we live, is it? When we can't pick it up, or things much more seriously than that, what do we do? We get frustrated, we get angry, we get disgusted, all the rest of it. So this has huge implications for the way we live. And I want to also suggest to you that if we lived like this, you would be the greatest blessing to the people around you. And it wouldn't be because you're some Pollyanna person who just makes good out of everything, that you're counting it pure joy, whatever God brings your way. Well, let's see how. When you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, and I'm absolutely struck by this next phrase, Lacking nothing. I mean, isn't that a remarkable promise for a new year? God says if we catch what's in this passage, there won't be anything we lack. I mean, it's pretty neat stuff. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. And that phrase will mean a lot to us uh, both today and uh, next Sunday as well. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So that's the passage we're going to look at. Now it goes on just a little bit more. This part we're not going to be able to look at quite in so much detail, but it's a part of the whole picture. It says, but let the brother of humble circumstances glory in his high position. You say, what? There's another one of them. Glory in the fact that you are humble in your circumstances. Because, like flowering grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises and scorches with wind and withers the grass and its flowers fall off and the beauty of it disappears uh, as it is destroyed. Now, it was fun to me. Somebody was telling me this morning that uh, they're really enjoying the phrase radiant beauty. And I've shared with your ladies, as we've looked at First Peter in the past, that God wants to give you an unfading beauty that does not fade away. Now, men, at least it used to be this way, weren't quite as concerned about how they looked on the outside. But for you ladies, because our culture is vested in with so much power, we try to pretend. And scripture says he's talking here about an unfading beauty. So too the rich man is in the midst of his uh, pursuits will fade away. But the man who really understands who God is, is not going to do that. So he says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now that part we're going to look at next week. That's looking at the result. Now, do you see this? This is, this is an arresting passage of Scripture. There are some really remarkable promises here. And so what I'm hoping, this amazing truth uh, is so contrary to everything we think that God will help us to realize it's a very special thing. So to put it in a summary, he said, blessed is the person who preserves, uh, perseveres under trial. So now would you say that that would be what you'd like your perfect 2015 to look like. God says, if you persevere under trial with all that he's going to share with us, you'll be blessed. <coughs> now, you see what I love about this? So much of what goes on in some of the modern-day church now is they say God wants everybody to be healthy, wealthy, all of that. And it's a lot. And yet people flock huge, big churches, one not too important to name the pastor, but huge big church, written all kinds of books, one of the biggest churches in the country. That's his message. It's a lie. God didn't promise that. Most of us don't experience that. 
And so people who set themselves up like that set themselves up with what I like to call a Santa Claus theology, and when you find out it's not true, you lose everything. And what's so neat about this passage, it's looking like square in the face, and it's giving us remarkable promises. And that's what I love about the scripture. Well, how do we live 2015 to receive this blessing? That's what I'm anxious to have us come to understand. Well, obviously the answer is have happy thoughts. <laughs> now, I had a wonderful grandmother. I loved her. I've talked about her a little bit. Remarkable pianist, organist, Juilliard graduate, played the big organ in the, in the park in San Diego. But that's what she'd always say. Have happy thoughts. That's just a nauseating nothing. <laughs> Other people say, don't worry, be happy. Very similar to that. You know, many of you have heard that phrase. One of Ruthie's favorite songs is that song that talks about that, you know. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't know the tune well enough, but it's really fun. Uh, many people will say, uh, buy this, eat that, go here, do that. That's how you'll be happy. And all you have to do is look at Madison Avenue and the advertising and you understand that one. Buy this, eat that, go here, do that. All those kinds of phrases. Then there is this one theological group, and it's called Name It and Claim It. God wants you happy, healthy, and wealthy. And they make all these exaggerating phrases that go along, and it sets people up for a huge default. And Or you could say, especially this year, go to the Rose Parade. The theme of the Rose Parade is inspiring stories. And the major inspiring story is Louis, or is... Uh, um, Zamberini. And uh, Louis Zamberini was a Christian. Came to know Christ at a Billy Graham crusade. The movie, uh, which is really a disappointment, leaves all of that out. But the book, Unbroken, Casa had honored Louis Zamberini a lot. And so there's something significant there. But what's so amazing about the world, the inspiring story about Zamberini for them, is his own strength to endure, not that he had it in Christ. And that's just a hollow nothing. So I want you to see over the next two weeks five things that are going to be necessary for 2015. And this first one is absolutely mind-boggling. Consider it pure joy, my brethren, when you encounter various kinds of problems. Now if I could give you anything, okay, are we having trouble with Ken again? Yeah. He promised me he wasn't going to do this today. Okay, we're just going to kind of take a minute and see what's going on. One of the wonderful things is we have this wonderful doctor in our class now, and, and I feel so comfortable with him to be able to care for these kinds of things. So they'll, they'll assist him. So we'll go on a minute. Yeah, we're going to pray about this in a minute. And then we'll come back to our class. Lord, here we are in the midst of this study that we're starting now to consider pure joy when we face various kinds of trials. And Ken and Mary are doing that. And we pray that you'd really be intervening. Thank you that we've got medical people here that know how to handle things like this. And I pray that you give Mary real peace as she goes through this with Ken. And then whatever's going on, Lord, that you'd help us to know how to help him the most. Pray that the doctors would be able to attend to him well. And we thank you that you've got every one of his days laid out before one has come to be. So we uh, we bring him to you and we do it in Christ's name. Amen. So I think we're calling paramedics on this one, so they'll be here in a little bit. And just kind of keep going. All right. All right, so it says, Consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when you encounter various <coughs> kinds of trials. Now, how do you do this? And I'm hoping you'll really think with me about the, the bizarreness of it. But it's talking to who? He's not talking to non-Christians here. You see, that's what's so sad about Zamberini's uh, film, is that it doesn't talk about the fact that he knew Christ, and that's the means by which he was able to forgive his captors. This is written to Christian people people who are the children of God. Now we've already talked about the fact that this phrase is strange. Uh, many would say it's almost mentally uh, unstable. 
uh, to say, consider it pure joy when you have various kinds of trials, that almost sounds like a, uh, a person who just specializes in feeling bad. This one lady who was a hypochondriac, uh, she died. And you know what it said on her tombstone? She said, see, I told you I was sick. <laughs> All right, so we're not talking about that kind of a thing. We're not talking about this willy-nilly deal. This stands against everything we define as a joy. I think for most of us, if we were really looking for the definition of a perfect year, it would mean that everything goes our way. Our kids would be healthy, our health would be good. Joy is defined as everything's going my way. You know the old song that used to come around? zibbity doo da zibbity day my oh my, what a wonderful day. Everything's going my way. Well, that's not what Scripture's saying here. And this is what I love about Scripture. It's so truthful. All right, so it stands against the health and wealth preachers who are giving false teaching. And I hope you've not been caught up in them. They're all over the television, and people just flock to them because they're telling us what we want to hear. But I love the fact that Scripture can look like square in the face, deal with it as it really is, and I don't have to pretend. It makes no sense to the natural man. This passage, if you brought it to your non-Christian and you said, well, just to be blessed, everything's going to turn out just fine, it, it isn't that. So he says, consider it pure joy. Well, what does the word consider mean? It means to come to full understanding, to have an accurate belief, to give full mental energy to discern the truth and live in its power. So in other words, what God is inviting us to do is to take this truth and really make it come alive. For our, It's not just something we read on a page. Now, you all know this passage because we've talked about it so often. 2 Corinthians 4, 16-18. Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away. Now we know that probably better than any other group in the church. You look at the young people, and they don't sense that at all. I look at my two teenage grandsons, and, you know, everything's just ahead of them. And they can do almost anything they want. They were helping me unload the car and do all the things I can't do. They don't have an awareness of the outward wasting away. And yet one of those grandsons and I were talking about this in the car as we took my dad, my 97-year-old dad, back to his home after he'd been with us for Christmas. We talked about the outwardly wasting away. And I said, John, he's the grandson named after me, because I work with older people, I'm much more aware of my own outward wasting away than I was when I was younger. And we live with one another. Matter of fact, you know, I've heard this. There are people who will not come to this class because they don't want to be around walkers and wheelchairs. Hmm. And, and one of the things I want you to realize, and we don't have walkers here, there's one over there, and there's a couple over here. You know what those are? They're constant reminders of God that you're outwardly wasting away. But listen to the verse. It says, though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed, so we don't lose heart. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not in what is seen, but what is unseen, for what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. Well, in Hebrews, it goes even further, speaking to this same subject. And it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the, hin the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now, I want you to take a minute and stop and think about this. Who marked out the race? God did. And do you realize that for Ken, part of his race marking out includes this fainting stuff that's going on right now? God is the one who wrote that race. This isn't happening by mistake. It's happening because God knows what he's doing. Do you realize how much comfort there is in that phrase? 
God is the one who's marking out your race. He's got all the hurdles in just the right place. He's got the lanes marked out. He knows exactly what's going on. Do you realize how comforting this is? And let us run with perseverance the race, not that we've chosen, but that God has marked out for us. And what's our finish line? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Now, I hope you'll, you'll think about that. Maybe even you want to mark that in your verse, in your, in your Bible. God's the marker of the race. He laid it out. For some of you, one of those hurdles has cancer written on it. For some of you, there's death written on some of those hurdles. Some of you have gone through death of children, some of spouses. Some of you have other kinds of issues going on. God is the one who marked out that race. And you're going to see in a minute how important that is. But notice this next. For the joy set before him, he, Christ, endured the cross. Now, I want to ask, and I think we all know the answer, but do we really experience the answer, which says, is there anything more painful than the cross? And, you know, for us, the things we're going through are the most painful events we experience. But what's going on really, God says, is when Christ focused on the cross and scorned its shame, it says, he sat down at the right hand of the throne. How did God not lose heart in Jesus Christ? Because he knew what was coming in the future. And we'll see that. And so it says to us, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you might not grow weary and lose heart. So as we go into the challenges that would contradict this, count it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, how do we do that? We look at the way Jesus handled the cross. And how did he do it? He knew what was coming. Do you ever think about the pain of the cross? Now, one of the things, and I haven't seen it, many of you have, the uh, experience of the uh, movie, um, what was the name of it? The, the, the Passion, the Passion, where they tried to capture a little bit what was going on there. Uh, and, and I think probably caught quite a bit of it, but I'm not sure that we could really understand what, what was going on in the life of Christ as he bore all the sins of the world. But that pain, Scripture says, was overcome in his life by the joy that was set before him. And so one of the things we need to learn how to do is to be able to help each other to have that eternal perspective. And that's where this passage that says we don't lose heart really speaks to it. It says we don't set our eyes on the temporary, we set our eyes on the eternal. So what kind of joy does God want us to have? Well, he defines it. Pure joy. Now I wonder, are you experiencing that? Could you say this morning that you are experiencing pure joy? Even today, right now, let's say things are going pretty well. You had a wonderful Christmas celebration. Would you be able to say, no, I'm experiencing pure joy? Pretty amazing phrase, don't you think? All right, so he says, this is a decisive conviction, an unmovable experience, pure joy, complete joy, total joy, undefeated joy. A 2 Corinthians 12, 10 kind of a joy. What says, I delight in difficulties, hardships, and persecution. That's what this pure joy is that we're talking about. You follow? Now what I love about this, this isn't the joy that we normally talk about, where everything is going my way. I can look at whatever's happening, and I can rejoice in what God is doing. Do you realize what a wonderful gift this is? If you can grab this, it will change everything about your new year. All right, so... Uh, it's really, I think, to talk, talking about a Job kind of joy. Now, you know the book of Job, don't you? Job 23.10 says, He knows the way I take, and when he has tested me, I will come forth as a gold. 
I want you to let that sink in a minute. The kind of experience of joy that Job had is the kind of joy that God wants us to have in James 1. The pure joy that comes from the Lord that literally contradicts what's going on in my life. James chapter 1 verse 3 gives us the second of the five things we need to look at. First one is, if we're really going to have a great year in 2015, we're going to have pure joy because we're looking at life and its difficulty as God wants us to. The second of the five things is because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. In other words, God says we're not just willy-nilly counting it in pure joy, but we're counting it pure joy because we know that God has a purpose in it. And I want you to grab something really important here. To have a blessed 2015, you need to know something. Now, I'd just be curious. It would be fun if we had a quiz. If today we could talk about what do you need to know to have pure joy in 2015? Now, I wish we really could, in a sense, just kind of stop and have you write down an answer. What do you think you need to know? And he tells us that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now, at first glance, you'd say, okay, okay John, I'm not so sure about that. How does that testing of your faith producing perseverance bring pure joy? Right, so let's look at it. The thing I need to know, first of all, is there is a tester. This is not happening by mistake. What's going on with Ken and Mary right now is not happening by mistake. What went on with this family in San Diego that lost their son is not happening by mistake. Bud Wallace's eternity began a week ago today, not by mistake. There is a test tour. God is directing his plan, purpose, and promise. Now, I've used those three Ps a lot in this class over these five years, and I want you to capture those three words. You can't have one without the other two. You can't have the two without all three. God's plan, his purpose, and his promise. We're going to see a lot of that today and next week. And we kind of captured it in a long phrase. And in any of you really creative writers, if you could ever help me to take this sentence and make it shorter, I'd love to, but I don't know how to. Uh, it, it, all the words here are really critical for me, but if you who are writers ever could help me shorten this up and say the same thing, I would love it. But our phrase is, you will never live in the joy and victory of God's promise unless you understand and submit to his purpose. Now, do you realize that there's all kinds of books written? One of the worst is written by a Jewish rabbi called Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. And it's an awful book. Lots of people have read it and supposedly found comfort from it. But it's an awful book. Part of what has to happen if we're going to count a pure joy is we have to understand what God's purpose is and then submit to it. And those two things are two separate steps. We'll talk about some more of that as we go along. Now, there is a tester, and it isn't Satan. Now, let me, let me really put that down. Satan is not the tester. You'd say, no, wait a minute, though. Didn't he come and tell God, look at Job? But who was the tester? It was God. He was the one that was writing the test. And he gave permission for Satan to do certain things and not do other things. God who is sovereign, who is my heavenly Father, who is the giver of every good and perfect gift, who has proven his love to me by giving me his Son, has a plan for me in which I can experience pure joy. <coughs> I look across the room, and I'm not going to pick people out because I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I know many of the stories in this room right now are really being challenged at that pure joy piece. And it's hard to understand. Some of you have said to me, John, I don't understand what's going on. What's God doing? I don't understand. 
And so we struggle with these things in a deep sense of the word. This tester is giving me everything I need for life and godliness. 2 Peter 3, verse 4. Now, how much does he give us? Really? Now, if we really believe that, then whatever comes, I can count it as pure joy because God is giving me everything. But it doesn't make sense to the non-Christian. It doesn't, doesn't make sense to my flesh. Well, the tester knows everything about me, and uh, this phrase is really important for me, 2 Corinthians 10, 13, and a couple of us have talked about this. Some people say, well, this is talking about temptation. I'm saying, no, it's talking about temptation and trial because all of it comes together. So although the word temptation is taken here, the trial is the temptation. So don't get hung up there. It says, no temptation, may I suggest, or trial has overtaken you, but is which is common to man. Now that doesn't mean a whole lot. The next part is what's good. God is faithful. He will not let me be tempted or tried beyond what I can bear. And when I am tempted, he will also pray a way out so that I can endure it. Now, uh, one of the things that's really important is each of us face our trials differently. And something that would be devastating for one person may not be devastating for the other person. And we need to recognize that God knows that more supremely than anyone else. And so Paul gives us a classic example of this when he says, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was giving a spear. Now, we've talked before that the translation says thorn. That's not a good translation. It's much bigger than a thorn. So I'm putting the word spear in there. Was given a spear in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away. He said, well, of course... I don't want you to have any pain at all. I want everybody to be healthy and wealthy, and I want you just to have my blessing. Now that's what we want to hear. Sadly, friends, that's what a lot of preachers are telling people. But I want to tell you there is more joy in hearing what Scripture really says than what the liars tell you. And what is he saying? Three times I plead with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, no, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. So Paul says, the choice of my life is, therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power might rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, and catch this word, I delight in you see how crazy this is? This makes no sense to the natural person. I delight in weakness, insult, hardships, persecutions, and difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Now let me tell you, in your natural mind, you will never get here. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. The second thing we need to know, first one is, we need to know there's a test of and that tester is God. That is so comforting if you let that sink in. But the second thing is, we need to know that God the tester has a good purpose in the test. And when we understand that, then it's coming to understand his purpose. So what is it? Well, he tells us right here in the text. It's to produce perseverance. Now, what is perseverance? It's living life from God's point of view, trusting him in every situation, finding joy in his plan, purpose, and promise. That's perseverance. Now, I wonder, it would be really fun, and maybe we'll do a little of this at our luncheon together, is to have a few of you talk about an experience where you had this happen, where you went through something and you really experienced God's perfect plan, purpose, and, and promise. There is a great example for us in Hebrews 11. Matter of fact, the whole chapter is full of examples. But this one is about Moses, verses 24 to 27. And it says, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, 
He chose to be mistreated with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt. Now there's where you learn how to experience pure joy. But notice this next. He said he did this because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Part of this, and we'll see it even a little bit more next week, is that we will count it pure joy because we realize that God has a plan at the end of the trial. And some of that involves heaven, some of it involves things he's accomplishing right now in our own lives. The person who is considering it pure joy to be in the center of God's will, no matter what uh, that means, has an eternal view of things. This person looks past the suffering to the result. Now, a very minor, and I really want you to understand this, a very minor example of that is my back surgery. And although spine surgery is nothing to fool around with, what I've gone through is nothing compared to what many of you have gone through. But we determined that it was worth the risk and the pain and the recovery because of what the end product could be. The reason I put off surgery for so many years is because I had heard so many bad stories. And they've come so far since 1989 when I did my original injury. And, and this is in the very smallest, almost unworthy to go on to the book here is what my back surgery is. It's being able to say, all right, especially the first two weeks, uh, and still a little bit now, is to say, all right, this is worth it because of what it's going to produce on the other side. Now, that makes no sense in the spiritual realm unless the Holy Spirit is really there to make it real for you. How could you say in a loving way to this family in San Diego that lost their son eternally to hell to say God had a purpose in this. Dear friends, this is not simple stuff. And it really boils down to, do we believe, first of all, what God <coughs> said? And if we do, how does it get applied then? All right, so the second thing we need to really understand is that God has a purpose. And his purpose is to produce perseverance. And we'll look at this a little more next week. But I want to give you the third one of the five. James chapter 1, verse 4. He says, Let perseverance have its perfect result, so that you may be mature, complete, lacking nothing. In other words, God says, I can count it pure joy because God has a purpose for the trial. And that purpose in the trial is that we would learn to persevere. And if we do, do you catch this? You won't lack anything. You'll be mature and complete. To have the joy and victory of God's promise, you must understand and submit to his purpose. Now, do you understand what stress is? Stress is trying to get what I want in the way I want it in the time I want it. And when I don't get that answer, it's stressful. Or if you will, my definition of stress is a sinful response to the trials of life. And one word that really captures that is frustrating. I am so frustrated. Well, why? Because I'm not getting my way. And you see, a part of what counting it pure joy is to say, Lord, I want your way, and I know your way is best. Now, let me tell you, that is not simple. Sometimes God's way is very difficult. This I'm frustrated part is so often a part of our lives. We have the opportunity to enjoy God's perfecting work. Just like uh, Paul did. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take the spear away. He said to me, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore I delight in his plan. Now, one thing that's really important for me, and this is what I really struggle with over these, these two Sundays, how do I get you to really understand this? I probably <coughs> would have much more success if I came to you and I gave you a health, wealth, name it, and claim it message. 
and say, it's all going to be wonderful. All you got to do is just trust God, name it and claim it. It's going to be wonderful. Because that makes sense to the natural man. Well, what this passage is saying, and it's so much richer, is I can count it pure joy when it doesn't work out the way I want it to go. If I really learn what God is up to. Uh, Romans 8, 28, you all know it, but I want you to notice the context. He says, we know, absolute certainty, that in a few things, how many things? God works. Remember, there's a tester, and it's him. God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. You see how important purpose plays here? For those God foreknew, he predestined, we've looked at this in our Ephesians studies, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he called, and those he called, he justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. So we rejoice in what God is doing. Isaiah 30 is a passage I really love in this regard. And the children of Israel, in a time of trouble, didn't turn to the Lord. Instead, they turned to themselves and to the Egyptians, their own plans. They, and I love the way Isaiah puts this, they were uh, trusting in things useless to them, it says, unwilling to listen to the Lord's instructions. Dear friend, I, I don't know how to say this to you in a way that you'll really, really hear it. If you trust anything less than Jesus Christ this year, you will find it useless. But if you trust him, no matter what comes, you're going to find this verse is true. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But the passage says of the children of Israel, you would have none of it. And my guess is, every one of us sometime this year are going to come up with this choice, maybe more than once, to say, are we really going to be able to, in quietness and trust, look to the Lord for our strength? Now notice what they did. They not only rejected what God said, they said, no, we'll flee on horses. And so in other words, what they were doing in that day, they were using their own means. They said, all right, we're going to run away from this evil. We're going to get all our horses, and, and we're going to have victory. Now, I love, and, it, and this is Isaiah 30. I'm not taking the whole chapter. You could read it on your own. It says, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Blessed are all who wait for him. Now, this is the phrase that's really important. Now, we are going to start in January an 11-week series in, ch in the upper church on suffering. Now, I'm not quite sure what they're going to do, but I hope somewhere they use this verse. Because it says, although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. What's that saying? God is the tester. See, that's what's so awful about the book why bad things happen to good people. Because he doesn't get this. God is the tester. He is the one who brings it. I love these two phrases. The bread of adversity and the water of affliction. But in the context, he says, if you respond properly, whether you turn to the right or the left, you'll hear your, a voice, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way walk in it. Dear friends, man, I don't know this couple that lost their son in San Diego. But we all felt it because the associate pastor the last minute had to come and lead the service and we were all praying at that time that God might save his life and he didn't. He died the next day. What do you say to those parents? How do you tell them? There will be a voice behind you saying, this is the way I'm walking. Then you will desecrate your idols. You will throw them away. All the things you've trusted that weren't me will go aside. And he will send you rain for the seed to sow in the ground. And food that comes from the land will be rich and plentiful. In other words, God's purpose is to mature us, making us complete, so that we lack nothing. Now, dear friends, you know what one of the major goals of the, the trial is? It's to get everything that you've trusted in aside from the Lord to be seen as a useless thing it really is. 
Now it's funny because I have people, it was early on when I came here, I did a message on Jeremiah upstairs with some major props talking about broken systems. It's fun for me because people still talk about that sermon five years later, which is great because God really made the point. And that's what God does. He throws rocks in your broken cisterns so that you'll get so thirsty, you'll come back to him, the fountain of living water. And that's what's here. And if we understand how profound it is when God brings the trial, he's trying to knock down the idols, all the useless things we're looking at instead of him. And so 2 Corinthians 1, 8 to 11, and you know the passage. We've looked at it before. Paul says, I don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under how much pressure? Far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. And I've told you before, a great way to translate that is, I'm so silent, this is beyond me. This is awful. Indeed, we felt in ourselves that we had received the sentence of death. But this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such deadly peril. He will deliver us in the future. On him we've set our hope that in the present he will continue to deliver us. But notice this, as you help us by your prayers. Now many people will tell you when they're going through real trial that one of the things that really sustains them is the prayers of their brothers and sisters. But what are we praying for? That God would help them understand that he's the test of So the tests in our lives show us who and what we're trusting. And what is the result of that? And if we're trusting in them or him. And do you realize what a great gift that is? Now there's been lots of times in construction stuff, and I've done lot, lots of it, where I put my trust in something and it failed. There was one point I should have died. I was a teenager and I was building a house. And uh, I was knocking down a wall. And I, this was stupid teenager. I was standing on top of the wall. I was knocking down. <laughs> That's kind of like the guy who's sawing off the branch and he's off the end, you know. <laughs> well, so when the wall went down, I went down and the whole wall collapsed on me. And there was this huge beam that came down with a huge spike in it that stopped going into my head, right? Just less than an inch. When I moved and I realized what had happened, it should have gone right through my brain and killed me. See, I was trusting in something that I shouldn't have trusted in, but yet, in the midst of that, the God in, his, in my foolishness protected me from being killed as a teenager. I, you know one of the things I think we're going to find when we get to heaven? All the amazing times when God intervened, we don't even have a clue. All right, so what God does in his word, in his testing of us, is that we would depend less and less on ourselves and more and more on him. Now, if depending on the Lord is the greatest blessing of all, do you see why we can count it pure joy when God brings trial that brings us to the end of ourselves? So how do we live like this? Now, this is what we're going to come back to next week and look in more detail. But let me just give you a piece of it today. How do I consider it pure joy when I face trials? How do I understand what God is doing? And how do I submit to what he's doing? Well, James 4 gives us the answer. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person does not, should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. And next week, we're going to come back and look at this in more detail, but let me just give you a hint of it. What is wisdom? It is the truth of God applied to the issues of life. So if I'm to count it all joy when I face various kinds of trials, what do I need? I need the ability to be able to see God's purpose and submit to it. And what does he promise to give us? That very ability. It involves understanding God's purposes, claiming his promises, and from that, determining our attitudes and our actions. It involves taking every thought captive, putting off lies, putting on God's truth. Now, where does wisdom come from? And I love this in Job, Job 28, 12 to 23. He has a whole list of things. He lists all the different places where we think we can find wisdom, but we can't. He says, where can we wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? No mortal comprehends its worth. And I love this. It cannot be found in the land of the living. 
Now, what's the land of the living? Although a few of you look a little dead this morning, it's <laughs> us. This is the land of the living. It's us. God says nowhere on earth are we going to find what we need. It's only in him. The passage goes on to tell all the places we cannot find it. But then he says, verses 23 and 24, God understands the way of it, and he alone knows where it dwells. For he views the end of the earth and sees everything under heaven. And then verse 28, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding. So let me summarize all of this for today. We're going to face trials of many kinds, right? My girls went to Christian Heritage College, where David Jeremiah is the pastor of that church down there. And one of their professors would always start his class. He says, life is a series of problems. Wouldn't you love to go to class if that's how you started every day? But it's true, isn't it? It is true. God's plan is that we will experience true and pure joy in it and through it. Do you realize what an incredible gift that is? God wants you to know pure joy in whatever is going to happen this year. So we need to know that he's the testor. He is. And that he has a good purpose in that testing. The purpose is to produce God dependence, God confidence, and Christ likeness in us so that we would be complete, lacking nothing. So now I want to introduce you a new word. You all know the word justification. I'm suggesting you what God wants to do for us in 2015 is Jesusific, Jesusification, Jesusification. It's hard to say that word, I, I've been wrestling with all week. Jesusification, he wants to make us like Jesus. In the midst of this, and all are trying to come to grips with what's happening in, in the way that things are taking place, God is wanting to make us like Jesus. So what do we do? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given you. Now, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit this to you, but with Ruthie sometimes, I'm impatient. If you doubt it, you can ask her, but in her grace, she won't tell you the whole story. But sometimes she'll ask me something, and, and I think she'd already know the answer, and I'm not, I'm not real patient. I don't like that much about me. But it's there. I don't think any of you have that problem, probably do. <laughs> do you realize that God is never like that? When you come in for wisdom, he said, you idiot. I told you that in my word. Why are you so stupid you're on your own? We'll see this a little more next week. God does not deal with us like that. One of our major needs for 2015 is to believe God and especially the promises that he's given to us. And this is where we're going to come next week. Now you have a different song in your notes. And as I was working on this after we printed the notes, I came up with another song I like better. So just put your notes away and listen to this song. It really captures what we're wanting to try to say here. Kyle, let's listen.
your mercies in disguise. We pray for wisdom, for your voice to hear. We cry in anger when we cannot feel you near. We doubt your goodness. We doubt your love. As if every promise from your word is not enough. And then all the while you hear each desperately and long that we'd have faith to believe cause what if your blessings come through raindrops what if your healing comes through tears what if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know your are Your mercies in disguise. When friends betray us, when darkness seems to win, we know the pain reminds this heart that this is not, this is What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if my greatest disappointments or the aching of this life is the revealing of a greater thirst this world can satisfy? Desperately, Lord, ask that you would help us to understand this truth. Uh, I really don't know, Lord, how I could love these people any more than I do. But I know I don't love them nearly as much as you do. And I want us, I want us to be people who counted pure joy when we face various kinds of trials. Not because it's some my wish of my own, because it's a promise of your word. Well, I admit to you, Lord, I, I wish things were different sometimes. Can't imagine this couple in San Diego, how we prayed on Christmas Eve that you would save this young boy's life and allow him to confess you as Savior. It's hard for us. And, and there's stories like that in this room where we don't fully understand. But Lord, I pray in this year, because of the time we spend together in this class and in our fellowship groups, that we would learn how to count up pure joy when we face various kinds of trials. And that we would understand that this perseverance that you're working in us this lacking nothing kind of perseverance is what you want for us. And Lord, I know I can't teach it. I can tell us about it. 
I can try to expound your word, but your Holy Spirit has to make it real. And so I pray as these folks leave today, that this would be the process of bringing pure joy into their lives as we enter this new year. Pray that as many of us gather on Wednesday, that we would just have a wonderful time thinking about some of this. Thank you for the film that will help illustrate a little bit. And then as we return next Sunday, we talk a little bit more about asking for this visiting. Well, Lord, you'd make this really real for us. And, and I pray it not just for us, but that as the older people in this congregation, we can model it to all the rest of us. Because there's been some huge pain in our congregation this year. And I long for us to be that radiant beauty in the life of the church where we can save our brother and sister that's really struggling. We know this is true. You can count it for joy because of God's help. So I pray, Lord, that you take us and we wouldn't let Satan or the world steal this thought away from us, but that we get so hungry for it that this will become a major theme for us in 2015. Thank you, Lord, for saying blessed is the one who perseveres under God. So we thank you that you're, you're the tester and you have a purpose. Submit to it. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.